This is a production of Cornell University. So, um, so it's great to be here in beautiful Ithaca. It's my first time at the Cornell, so I'm very impressed. And I'd like to tell you um, about the research that you know, I started in my lab in Vienna, and now I am continuing at, at the SOC, um, which is essentially um, revolving around the question, why do roots grow, and how do they decide to stop to grow or continue to grow? And um, the reason why I think it's very interesting and important to study roots is because um, while we typically every day we see the shoots of plants and we think they are so important to you know, fix CO2 and, 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 and make air uh, with, with the help of sunlight into, into matter, uh, into biomaterials, um, you know, without roots they can't do this, right? So roots, uh, they, they mine the soil, they take up the water, they need to search for, for water and nutrients and provide that to, to the shoot. Um, and uh, so, so they are a huge part um, determining uh, plant productivity. And interestingly enough, uh, shoot, uh, root architecture is very um, as dramatic or even more dramatic uh, if you compare them to shoot architecture that we see every day. Uh, so this is a beautiful drawing from Weaver uh, on, on prairie plants, and you can see uh, that actually um, there is that that they are really um, it's easy to distinguish species according to their uh, root system architecture. You have species that basically grow very deep, and you have species that form very shallow root systems that explore the upper soil layers mu much better. And and the big question is what what actually determines these differences? And and not only are these differences visible between different species they are also visible within one species. And, and so, so the work that I will tell you uh, about today is done in this tiny model species, Arabidopsis thaliana, um, and we use this because there are so many tools available for this, but we can study the processes that matter in the, in the, in the larger picture of evolution uh, also uh, within this single species because uh, different strains of these species uh, display very different um, root phenotypes. So, so we have natural variation already within the first two weeks of root development that you can see here. Just uh, seedlings of five different strains, accessions, uh, we call them, grown on agar plates. And you can see that there are accessions that grow very slowly and accessions that grow much faster, accessions that grow, that put out way more lateral roots and accessions that put, um, put out less lateral roots. And, 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 and using uh, like this uh, model species, nat well, natural variation within it, we can actually try to identify the genes and the variants of those genes that actually determine those differences. And, and that will tell us how actually roots you know, um, grow, are, are basically genetically programmed to grow or to, uh, in a certain direction, to a certain depth, or uh, stop to grow in response to certain signals. Um, so um, I, I was just alluding to the signals that make roots grow or stop to grow. This can be nicely seen here. Also, you know, just a five-day very early time course is enough to, to see this very, uh, very, 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 um, very clearly. So this, uh, those, this is the same accession because Arabidopsis is a sulfur. Those are all isogenic plant. So we are seeing here responses of the same genome to different um, growth conditions where we either remove the iron from the medium or the phosphate or the sulfur or we, we reduce the pH, and you can see that the same genome actually responds uh, very stereotypically to those uh, environmental changes. Uh, for instance, in iron deficiency, this accession stops to grow very early on, and then there's some hypocotyl elongation even. And then under, uh, under phosphate deficiency, the same accession actually grows uh, basically a little bit faster than under full medium. Uh, so, so we can see that we can study both the genotypic, you know, uh, causality for different root, uh, for, for root growth, but as well look at uh, the responses of uh, genotypes and, and of accessions to different environments. Um, and to, to map the genes and, and identify the, the, the mechanisms that are responsible to this, and maybe even to learn how this relates to adaptation, uh, we make use of, of a resource that has been built by Arabidopsis researchers over many decades, starting in the 30s of the, of the last century, when people started to collect Arabidopsis all over the world. So this is a, this is a polar projection of the, 
uh, mainly the northern hemisphere, and every dot here corresponds to one strain of Arabidopsis that has been collected at some point in time. And you can see that actually, actually Arabidopsis grows as a weed. It grows kind of everywhere, grows from uh, northern Sweden to southern Spain, even northern Africa, grows from the Atlantic coast uh, into uh, Central Asia, and, and we know that there are even Chinese accessions. So basically, Arabidopsis has expanded like all over Eurasia and was introduced later on to, to uh, the Americas. And so, so, so all these strains are available in stock centers. We know where they came from. And many of these strains have been a genotype with high resolution, SNP chips, or even resequenced completely. So we can actually start to draw the genotype to phenotype maps. And we can ask, you know, are, are some, some alleles actually distributed in a manner that we can understand how that relates to adaptation? So how do we do this? Uh, we use uh, a method called genomes, uh, uh, genome-wide association mapping. I just briefly out outline how this works. The principle is very simple. The statistics behind it are a little bit more complicated, but it's not necessary to understand this um, in, in detail right now. But the principle is we measure a lot of phenotype. Let's say short root, like the length of the root. Uh, we quantify this accurately. We take the genome sequence or the genotype data, and then we try to correlate the difference uh, the variation in the root lengths between different accessions to the variation in the genome sequence. So we do this all over the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis. And, and basically, for every uh, polymorphism that we find, we can ask, do uh, ha accessions that have a long root have a different nucleotide at that position than accessions co as compared to accessions with a short root, right? If all the accessions with a long root have an A, at this position, and all of the accessions with a short root have a G, this will be a very high correlation, very high association. And then we can uh, basically plot the probability for this association um, uh, like over the whole genome. And we are looking for peaks where this probability is, uh, so it's a, it's a leg negative logarithm of the p-value is very high. So that's essentially uh, the plots you will see today. Um, so when I started my lab, uh, six years ago, um, it was actually very simple. This part was actually getting very simple because there were lots of labs who loved to sequence Arabidopsis strains. So, you know, the labs of Detlef Weigel, Magnus Nordberg, and Joe Ecker, they, uh, you know, started sequencing more than a thousand accessions and, and genotyping efforts had been on the way. So, so we could just like download this part. So that problem was solved. What was not solved, uh, and, and, the, and the association mapping problem was largely solved as well. Um, by, by efforts from Magnus Nordbergs, and there was like lots of, I mean, of course, there's lots of acti activity in human genetics to do the same thing, and so, so, the, so the methods were actually well outlined. The problem actually is or was the phenotyping. So how to measure thousands, hundreds, thousands of roots without making graduate students jump out of the window and pure, you know, uh, because it's like so horribly boring. Right, and so, so what we developed was then like multiple ways to actually measure phenotypes um, as much uh, as, as possible in an automated way. So, so the main pipeline, and that is all the data that I'll talk today, is based on this. So we grow 24 seedlings on a plate, and then uh, we image them very efficiently using a scanner cluster. So we can acquire 300 uh, plants within uh, three minutes. And then we have uh, written algorithms that actually transform this image, an image like this, into data, uh, which is outlined here. So this, these are virtual representations of those seedlings. And, and because this is all you know, data, we can, we can basically measure everything uh, starting from the root length uh, to, the, to the angle at which roots grow and you, to the shape of roots and so on using this pipeline. And, and there is no human intervention needed for this step because um, those things work uh, largely automatically. So with this pipeline, we, we, um, I think we, we, we have quantified, I think, almost like 3 million individual images of seedlings in different conditions from very different genotypes. And that works very, very nicely for the first couple of days for root development to quantify accurately and with very high, at a very high scale, like large scale uh, phenotypes. And then we also, but I won't talk about this today, we also automated confocal microscopy that we could actually get nice confocal images, 3D stacks of images where we can actually measure cell size and, and, and things like meristem size to determine what is the area in which cells divide 
Um, and, and we could also successfully use this to map regulators of cell size and meristem size, and, and where uh, genetic variation uh, is causal for differences of, of cell size and meristem size. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, projects mainly, well, two and a half, um, uh, where we, uh, that illustrate, I think, nicely what we can do and what types of questions we can understand uh, using natural variation in our tools. Um, and this all uh, basically got started with this experiment where we um, used 200, around 250 accessions and exposed them to different conditions. So we just grew them on agar plates like depicted as here. So those are, is one accession grown in three replicates. Uh, well, I, I show three replicates for each condition. Um, and you can see that, as I showed in the movie before, that in different uh, uh, conditions when we drop out different nutrients, we actually get a very different uh, root response. And so we did this for each of those uh, 200, around 250 accessions, and we then can encode traits and colors. So here we encode growth rate. So uh, a yellow color means that uh, there's high growth rate, a blue color means there's low growth rate, and each of those rows here corresponds to one accession. So basically here you can see different patterns of growth responses. You can see that there are conditions like iron deficiency where you know, most of the accessions do basically the same thing. They stop to grow. Some of them stop earlier. So the, the blue that already get blue on day one, some of them stop later. Uh, so basically continue to grow despite this deprivation of iron. But then there are some conditions where basically some accessions basically increase their growth on day four, for instance, and some accessions decrease their growth. So you can see this, this response to the environment um, is, is really dependent on the genotype. And uh, because uh, especially micronutrients like, like iron will be in sufficient quantity already in the seed, this is most likely not dependent on like, accessions running out of a nutrient, but rather an active response to the information, to, to somehow a sensing process that tells them there's, less or, uh, there's basically less of this nutrient around. Uh, so you can see that uh, in, in this nice movie where, where, where for iron deficiency uh, where you can visualize very nicely this different response. So those are two accessions that, that grow the same way under full, uh, in the full medium, but this accession grows, uh, uh, like basically stops their growth very early on and then somehow prioritizes the hypocotyl growth a little bit more, and this accession continues to grow to a later time point under this, right? So we can use this to then quantify this and then ask what is actually, what are the genetic variants that are causing this difference? So the first uh, uh, you know, project that we started, we started to phenotype 138 uh, Swedish, uh, 134 Swedish accessions from this region. Those had been collected by Magnus Nordberg. And, and Sweden is actually a very interesting, um, uh, it's actually a very interesting collection because within Sweden, even if, if, uh, if you think the whole Sweden is cold, there are differences in climate. And northern Sweden is way colder than southern Sweden. And there are also differences in soil types and so on. Plus, it is a local population. So mostly the same alleles will, 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 will be present in this, uh, in this population. And, uh, and, and, and it's, uh, it's easier to map, map common variation for this. At least that's what, we, that's what we thought. And I think that's actually what we found. So uh, just to demonstrate you, so when we uh, did iron, uh, like growth on, on iron medium, so you can find everything, like all, almost always with natural variation. Some of the accessions, they actually stop very early, their growth. Some of them stop late and, and basically elongated longer. And then when we mapped this, we found this one peak on chromosome one that was above our significance threshold um, that was uh, very significant. So when we then zoomed in, so we in this, uh, in this region, um, it was in a region, the SNP was in the region um, of uh, FRO2, which is a um, major uh, regulator of iron homeostasis. So, so this is from, from a review uh, where you can see uh, the en enzymatic activity of, of FRO2, where, um, where it basically uh, does this, um, uh, catalyzes this reaction from um, iron uh, and, and, and to iron 2 plus which then can be transported within, uh, into the cell. And that function has been known already a long time and made it a prime candidate just based on its annotation. So usually we don't like to use annotation uh, for 
uh, prioritizing candidate genes because there is always the danger that you kind of wag your own tail, uh, that you kind of think um, something plays a role, and then when you look at the knockout mutant, of course, most likely it will play a role. So we always uh, typically take um, uh, additional independent data to assign more confidence to can candidate gene before we go on a more time consuming you know, genetic characterization of this. Uh, so um, in, in terms of this, we actually uh, looked at the expression level of FRO2 in those different accessions. I don't show the data here, but FRO2 was, what basically expression was increased in the accessions with a long root as opposed to the ones with a short root. So there was additional evidence for this. Of course, uh, the final test that you can do is to take the alleles from those accessions and put them in the mutant background if the mutant background shows a, a phenotype. And so, uh, so indeed, FRO2 actually under low iron conditions uh, shows a shorter root. And so what we did is we took the allele, the FRO2 allele from this short rooted accession. We took the allele from this long rooted accession and an intermediate accession and we, uh, we, we put it back into the mutant uh, background. Um, and in order to, um, because it's a very tricky business because we're dealing with expression level differences, because we don't want to be susceptible to to random insertion expression events. You can imagine that transgenes can insert in different areas of the genome, and that might, by chance, uh, basically uh, just uh, confer a higher expression level or lower expression level because that can be position dependent. We, we do uh, a lot of T1 independent insertions uh, and a phenotype in T1 uh, based on a, on, a, on a fluorescent marker system selection. Uh, so to be sure that we can actually average out position specific insertion events. And then um, um, when we did this, we actually see that under iron deficiency, uh, the, uh, the, the root length um, was complemented much, much better. So this is the, the mutant uh, con uh, like, uh, transformed with the empty vector in, uh, in, in uh, transgenic lines that uh, were uh, complemented with this long root FRO2 allele while uh, when we co uh, complemented with this short root uh, FRO2 uh, allele, it didn't complement at all. And, and most likely because FRO2 um, is in, in those accessions not expressed at that, at that point of time. Okay, so, so that uh, made us confident to say actually variation, natural allelic variation for FRO2 is causal for this. And it's just another example where we actually can go from the phenotype to the gene uh, with genome-wide association mapping very efficiently. And so, uh, so why is this? So uh, the polymorphisms between those two alleles are non-coding in nature. So there is no change of the, of the, of the amino acid sequence of the protein. Uh, there are a couple of uh, changes in the coding sequence that don't lead to an amino acid change. And there are also some SNPs in the regulatory region. Uh, so uh, this is all non-coding non -coding regulatory. Um, and, and consistently with this, when we measure in the lines that actually complement mentor to a better extent, uh, the expression, um, it is much higher compared to uh, the, the, the short root allele of row 2 And this is also completely non-surprisingly true for the enzymatic activity. So this higher RNA expression of row 2 translates in a higher activity of the enzyme that we can measure in this in this essay. So, so we can really, like going from, from the genetic variation over the expression to the enzyme activity, we can make the case that this is uh, more cause, uh, is causal. Another interesting thing was when we're thinking of natural variation that, that we see, you know, common natural variation populations, it will be most likely related to adaptation. But of course, like um, growing on agar plates in the first couple of days, and growing a little bit longer doesn't tell us uh, so much about um, effects that relate to fitness. So we basically did the test that we grew um, these complemented lines under alkaline pH where iron availability is actually uh, reduced. And we can see that um, uh, the, the allele of the FRO2 from the lines with the longer roots is actually much better in, um, in, uh, in, in dealing with this than uh, than, than the allele from the line of, uh, with the shorter roots. So we think that uh, somehow gives the plants an advantage to grow in iron limited environments. So does it matter uh, when, we look at the, when we look at the places where the accessions come from? So this is a map of Sweden, and this is the soil type. 
um, that is indicated by the colors. And you see that uh, when, when we look at the two fro alleles, one allele is the A allele, pictured in black. The other allele is the G allele, pictured in, in, uh, in green. We can see that most of uh, the, the black allele is actually in the north of Sweden, where there are pot soils, uh, which, which is a specific type of soil that's highly acidic and where iron, for instance, gets washed out very fast, um, while the other allele is predominantly in the other soil types in the south. So, um, so that could give an indication that actually the different alleles might be adaptations to different soil types. Now, um, this is not, not, not a like, complete evidence because it is very different, difficult to separate population structure. So um, um, th that means uh, those guys are way more related among each other than those guys from, from adaptive features. So to really test this, we would need to go to Sweden and, and do reciprocal transplants, and, and we, haven't, we haven't done this yet. But it's a hint, so it's an hypothesis that this might actually be one, the one fro to allele might be an adaptation, might be beneficial in pot soils. Okay, so that's one of, uh, one of these, these stories and, and, and these projects where we identified one gene and, and variants of the gene that is responsible for a certain trait and for a certain response. And we have a couple of those in the lab and, and, and it's very, very interesting. But of course, um, but of course, kind of uh, something that we know from you know genetics, biology, is that genes don't act alone. So you often have interacting genes, you have pathways, you have multi-subunic proteins, um, and and the question is, can we actually using natural variation um, and, and 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 the variants uh, from these? to identify um, more than one gene, but, but rather pathways or, or modules of genes that work together as proteins uh, and, and, and are important in, uh, for, for regulating traits and biological functions. And so, uh, so, so that is actually one of, the, one of the most exciting applications of genome-wide association mapping that I see because unlike a mutant screen where you basically really try to isolate the one mutation, we are having to deal with like a, a bunch of like of many mutations that we have to consider. This you can see as a disadvantage because it makes things complicated, but you can see it also as an advantage because if uh, you you might think that um, in one like to achieve one trait variation, you might target the same pathway multiple times, and if this is so, it might be a very important pathway for that trait. Okay. I wouldn't tell you about this if, if I wouldn't believe in it. So so this is why I believe in it. So. Um, what you first need to do if you want to consider multiple genes is you, you need to map multiple genes. And so, so the key in, in, in GWAS uh, is actually to increase the num number of lines you look at because it's a statistical approach, it's a numbers game. So, so what we did here was we increased the number of, of lines that we, uh, where we measured growth rate upon iron deficiency from um, the 134 that I showed you uh, into typical 200. 250 lines that we typically use to almost 500. And you can see that there are way more uh, uh, signals above the significant threshold than previously. So we got more than 20. Now we can actually start to ask questions. That are, are the genes that are close in immediate proximity of those peaks possibly interacting in the same pathway uh, in the same module? And so to do this, uh, we, we leveraged a genome scale um, uh, gene uh, model um, uh, from Arabidopsis that's called Aranet, uh, and that was uh, basically generated by Insuk Lee and Sue Rees lab at the Carnegie Institution a couple of years ago, and it integrated all like massive data types that were available at that time, and those were like expression data sets, co-expression from genes, protein-protein interaction data sets, literature mining, and so on, and a probabilistic network model that essentially depicts the probability of any to genes in the Arabidopsis genome to interact functionally. Um, and so, so when we basically asked then, when we took this network and asked if uh, genes that were uh, like Im immediate proximity of those peaks were predicted to have a functional interaction, we actually found uh, quite some of those evidences there. And um, um, when, when I first looked at this, this, this seemed to be uh, most interesting to me because it was a leucine-rich receptor kinase Cluster, um, yes. Do you know that those, those genes are being expressed in the same cell at the same time? 
uh, for those four genes, we don't really know. It's one of the one of the evidence codes in in, in the error net. Uh, but for these uh, genes, uh, it was actually coevolution the evidence code. So basically, a phylogenomic score that gave uh, gave rise to to these uh, po potential interactions. But but yeah, so so we are currently investigating if these genes are always or maybe in specific conditions are co-expressed. So um, yeah, so so that was very interesting to us because like the like one emerging paradigm in the field is that actually many of those receptor kinases that typically they, I mean uh, those uh, those are receptor kinases so they have a receptor domain a leucine rich receptor kinase domain uh, leucine receptor no, leucine rich repeat domain outside of the cell and and the thought is that they basically can uh, detect ligands outside of the cell and then uh, activate the kinase to signal something in the cell and it uh, and, and it is also thought that they basically multiple uh, LRR RKs um, can interact on the membrane and even compete compete with each other to prioritize uh, um, you know growth or defense or other processes so that they are keys to basically receive signals and in a combinatorial manner then uh, lead to signaling cascades that uh, affect growth and this is just one example uh, of, of I think the best studied system from Joanne Corey's lab uh, mainly where uh, the, the BRI1 uh, leucine rich receptor like kinase leucine rich repeat receptor like kinase um, interacts with others uh, and, uh, and, 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 and leads to a differential interaction of e uh, BAC1 with either this kinase uh, or this kinase, right? So there is, um, so, so, so the thought, the paradigm is basically now that uh, by depending on the interaction and the abundance of receptors, uh, you might get a different signaling output. And that was the reason why I thought this might be interesting because we have three receptor kinases here and one protein kinase that are downstream of receptor kinases. And, and that might just be like a module interesting to perceive the absence of iron and then lead to a different growth response. OK. So uh, of course, very hypothetical, right? So, um, so the next um, step is, of course, because we, before we wanted to <coughs> embark on a very laborious uh, journey to study this, was to see if we find any other evidence than this network evidence and the Seaworth evidence whether those four genes might actually interact. And when we think of the data that we already used um, for here, that's phenotypic data of accessions with different alleles, uh, we, we can actually think we can reuse the data and do a different test that is almost independent of this one. So in genome-wide association mapping, we test um, for variation, like genotypic variation and phenotypic variation for the correlation, but we do it one SNP at a time, right? We, we don't consider multiple SNPs together. Now, um, when we think those, uh, those genes and their variants might interact, we can actually look for accessions that have certain combinations of those multiple, uh, uh, of those four genes, uh, the, the, and then see if certain uh, combinations respond very different, non-additive, uh, if you compare them to, to, um, to the other combinations where you only have one. And that's what you can do with the same data. And that's what we did here. Um, so we have four genes. And we can have each gene in a major or minor allele configuration, if you want to simplify it to two, two versions. And so, so we can have accessions that have either all of them in the major allele combination, or you can have accessions that have all of the four genes in a minor allele configuration. And you can have everything in between, right? And so, so what is striking from this image is that basically these higher order minor allele combinations all are fast growers. So this is the growth rate up on iron deficiency. And so the fastest growers are all accessions that contain three or four combinations of minor alleles of those four genes, with one exception, that is the, uh, the, the double combination for uh, two specific genes, uh, FER1 and SIF3. So, so that was, to me at least, it was enough to say, okay, let's spend some time to test whether this is true. Okay, so I told Santosh, my postdoc, just generate all possible higher mutants. And yeah, it took a while. We get in the time machine. Three years later, uh, we have this. Uh, 
so, um, so, so, so this is basically the outcome of all possible combinations of those mutants. So, so we can see it's, it's very complicated. There are a lot of effects. This is the growth rate up on iron deficiency. And, and this is kind of the same nomenclature as I, I showed you before with the variants, like four genes. And the capital letter is the wild type form. And then the non-capital letter is the mutant form. OK. So let's go, uh, let's go directly to the statistics here. And I'm going to guide you through this complex analysis. OK, so the first good news was that, and we knew that before. We tested the single mutants before. But so, so all of the single mutants are uh, significantly different from, from the wild type. So this is a significant uh, code for the ANOVA. And we can test the effect of singles and of multiples. Okay. So, so we know that all of these receptor-like kinases, so those are the three, and the protein kinase are somehow necessary for the appropriate response to iron deficiency. OK, so that's good. Interestingly, like those, uh, those three actually grow s much slower than wild type. And th this one grows slightly faster. OK, so, so then we, we start with the interactions, because that's our working hypothesis that those four genes interact. So the first one actually is very striking. The most uh, uh, interesting and most significant interaction actually occurs for those two receptor-like kinases, SIF3 and FUR1. And uh, you can see this very nicely. They really epistatically interact. Because if you look at the single mutants for those two genes compared to the wild type, they lead to a strong reduction of root growth rate up on iron deficiency. Right? If you combine those two mutations, you actually uh, uh, get a, less, less, um, a lesser decrease. Right? So basically, we would typically, um, you know, in the additive model, we would assume that we would get like a growth rate around here. But we actually get a growth rate that is reversed, right? So it's a typical, uh, uh, it's a typical evidence for an epistatic interaction. So those genes truly genetically interact. And if you remember the variant analysis that I showed you previously, it's the same combination that we actually uh, that we actually found this uh, dramatic increase already using the double the double um, in accessions that actually harbored the double minor allele combination. So there's something special about this interaction. OK. So that's a very primitive model. So this is my Lucian rich repeat domain. And, and, and it's the kinase. And so they, too, somehow, it's a working hypothesis, interact. They're on the membrane. They interact. And they somehow regulate growth up on iron deficiency. So um, the question is, is it, is it actually true? So uh, uh, some evidence came, actually, uh, interestingly, at the time where we were still busy generating the double and the triple and the quadruple mutants, um, came from the lab of Yusuf Belkadir, who, is a colleague at the, who was a colleague at the Gregor Mendel Institute. Um, and he did an in vitro screen for 80% uh, of all leucine receptor, uh, uh, leucine-rich receptor-like kinases in the Arabidopsis genome. Uh, and multiple hundreds. And he, he did an in vitro screen where he expressed all of these and, and, and scored the interaction using, uh, using a, um, a color assay. And, and one of the most noble, notable interactions was among, among the two receptor kinases that we found that were included in his, in his assay, uh, so SIF3 and FUR1. So that gave additional evidence that they might truly interact uh, uh, physically on the membrane. We could also do, when we did the co-IP to test this, uh, so um, we basically pulled down first the one receptor kinase, SI3. And then we pulled from this pull down the other one with another tag. Um, and, and so we basically could show that we can actually pull them down together so that they are very close by. So, so that would be another evidence that they physically interact. And we are currently doing uh, more advanced microscopy to test this using uh, using uh, advanced microscopy methods like FRET. OK, so, so we believe that those two receptor kinases interact on the membrane. But how does this relate to, iron, uh, to low iron levels and growth response uh, to low iron levels? So, um, so when we treat uh, reporter constructs um, that we express in tobacco with water, uh, we, uh, we basically still see a high abundance of, uh, of these proteins that are fused with fluorescent, uh, with the fluorescent protein here uh, in, in, the, in the membrane. But when we basically withdraw the iron, we see that actually the signal gets much weaker. We can actually see this uh, when we do the Western blot. 
In the same material, we can see that if we treat with an agent that removes the iron, we lose this protein, right? It gets degraded. So, so one of the mechanisms that, uh, that somehow plays a role here is that if you have low iron levels, uh, the receptor kinase will be removed from the membrane. So the interaction partner, when we did the same experiment as here, we didn't observe any depletion from the membrane. So, so we think actually um, in the context of this, uh, of this, of this receptor kinase module, uh, we have the two receptors that uh, are interacting, and then iron deficiency leads to the removal of one, and, and this other one might be free for interaction with other partners on the membrane. Um, of course, we wanted to test if this is really true in the root. So those were just uh, tobacco assays. And um, because uh, we can do long-term imaging, we can actually do the same experiments in growing roots. And um, so, so that's one of our experiments where we track the root over time. And on the same microscope, we have a two-chamber system. We basically um, add water to this, and we add ferrazine to this. It removes the iron. Right? And so the signal that you observe here is, again, from this one receptor kinase that we think uh, is degraded. And you can see under normal conditions, the signal is quite constant, and the growth is quite constant of the root. But under iron deficient conditions, you can see two very interesting things. Uh, there's no growth. And at the same time, the level of this receptor kinase is much lower. Then somehow, there is an increase of the signal again. So there's more receptor kinase gets again in the membrane. And that is the point of time when it starts growing again. So basically, the abundance of this receptor kinase correlates very well with growth under iron deficient conditions. Uh, we did this experiment more than 12 times repeated. And we can see very reproducibly that the signal of the protein is kind of stays constant under control conditions and basically decreases much under ferrozine iron deficiency conditions and then increases again at, at, at a point. So, so we think the, the, the transient um, assays that we, the assays that we did in tobacco are really well representing that one of the effects of the iron deficiency is to remove this receptor kinase from the membrane. OK. So let's get back to our uh, power experiment here. Uh, so we can actually see multiple other interaction terms. And essentially, it tells us that um, there's gen evidence from the genetics that all these four genes interact based on the mutant analysis. So uh, this leads to another very non-sophisticated model that, um, that basically all of them somehow interact and that they in impact growth. OK, so that's not very satisfying. Uh, so we were very happy when we got another hint from Yusuf Balkadir's lab. Because um, he had done this in vitro screen of 80% of all the receptor kin uh, leucine rich repeat receptor kinases in Abridopsis. And another um, interaction that he found with fur, which is um, the, the second kinase uh, that we had found that I showed you here, uh, was that it interacted with the flagellin receptor, FLS2. So this is a receptor that, that perceives flagellin uh, from bacteria and leads to the onset of the defense response. And so, so that ma made us uh, to think that, that maybe we found a module that somehow connects defense and iron deficiency signaling. And so, so the first thing that uh, we did together with Yusef was to test the effect of flagellin on the root growth of, of the mutant. So, so in the wild type, if you apply flagellin here, you see a reduction of root growth because the root stops to grow. Um, but this is abolished in the receptor mutant because there's no receptor to perceive the flagellin. And it's also abolished in the fur mutant, which is uh, one of our receptor kinases. Um, you can, can see this here. So somehow we have found that at least one of these receptors that we found is involved in the regulation of growth upon iron deficiency, but also upon the presence of, me uh, of uh, molecular signatures of pathogens. Uh, and this is also true. So the, the ROS response is one of the earliest defense responses, also impaired in this fur mutant. Right? So, so more evidence that there is a connection between um, uh, growth regulation under low iron conditions and under uh, defense situations. And you can also see that uh, the, if you look at the growth of bacteria, um, basically the fur mutant is almost as, as much compromised as the FLS2 mutant here. <laughs> so, so we know then that one of the components we found is involved. 
Interestingly, another receptor kinase of the, of the three we found, SIF3, and there was also uh, the one that I showed you earlier with its interaction with, with, uh, with FER1, um, has also been implicated in immu immunity in a different study before by, by Jane Parker, where uh, basically this um, um, mutation of this and, and, and different alleles lead to compromised immune responses. So, so this in, leads to our current uh, working model that I want to share with you, where we actually have we, we have we have stumbled upon this module here, and we know it is important for um, the regulation of growth upon iron low iron levels, and we, we know also that at least um, like uh, this this part here can interact with the FLS2 receptor, and what we actually think what's happening here is that it's a module that processes um, um, signals from bacteria or like signatures from bacteria and iron abundance it, like uh, in the same module on the membrane. So when, when, there's, iron, uh, when there's iron deficiency, um, so typically those three are in a complex under happy growth conditions, no irons, no pathogens. And so under iron, so FER1 is basically um, not available for an interaction with FLS2. But if the iron is going away, um, and we think this might be in part perceived by this receptor kinase, um, you remember uh, the, the mutant actually had increased growth rate under iron deficiency as if, if it wouldn't sense that the iron is low. Um, we think, uh, we, we know that SIF3 is actually degraded, and um, those two receptor kinases don't interact directly, and fur is actually free to interact with FLS2 receptor, which somehow leads to a stop off growth. So that's a working model. There are many open questions, which we're currently solving by co-treating with iron and flagellin, and, and so, um, so to corroborate this working hypothesis. I mean, what is known that there is a, there's a very intimate relation of iron levels and defense um, that has been described in a very descriptive manner in the past by people, and, and we think that actually might be a key module. So I think uh, what, this, what this nicely shows is that you you, you can, can leverage um, uh, you know, quantitative genetic approaches to identify multiple genes, get to interesting mechanisms that tell you not interesting and novel biology, uh, and, 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 and lead uh, to, uh, to basically um, a better understanding how actually there's crosstalk. And the interesting thing about this crosstalk is that it seems to be entirely happening on the membrane. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Is that, uh, yeah, okay. A few minutes, okay. So, so there's the other question. So is this, is this specific to iron? So when we stumbled about this, we were actually very, we were kind of surprised. And, and so, um, so, so we were thinking, okay, so that's just one way. There's like this one intersection of, uh, of the response to micronutrient deficiencies or low levels in the environment and defense. But when we then um, did other screens, and, and we do a lot of screens, we actually uh, found something very interesting uh, in collaboration with Hartem Ruachet, who is at the INRAM Montpellier, when we looked at zinc deficiency response, where you can see very nicely that accessions also respond very differently. Some accessions actually um, don't bother very much, even increase their growth rate under zinc deficiency in the first couple of days, and some of them actually reduce their growth rate quite a bit. So we met this, we found a zinc deficiency specific peak on chromosome four, um, and that was, um, located very close to um, the AZI1 gene and other AZI. So AZI1 gene is implicated in systemic uh, immunity and in, in, in priming uh, based on the effect of um, Atza lake acid um, and uh, that already had been described. And it's the prime candidate in this region because it's also expressed much higher up on zinc deficiency than all the other genes in this region. Uh, so, so when we then uh, used the mutant and the overexpressor and conducted those growth assays under zinc deficiency conditions, we actually see that that these uh, that uh, the lack of AZI1 that is uh, is an immunity gene actually causes roots to grow very to respond very differently to the zinc deficiency. Um, so this seems to be specific to zinc, and, and uh, when we did the same assay with the same mutant and overexpressor line, there was no difference under iron. So when we did the complementation, uh, we could actually conclude AZI variation at the AZI locus is, is truly causal for this different growth behavior under zinc deficiency because 
if we uh, took a long root allele and transformed it, uh, uh, a long root AZI allele transformed it in the, in the knockout, it was much better complementing this short root phenotype under minus zinc. So, um, um, so then, of course, the obvious, obvious uh, conclusion or the hypothesis would be that there's an interaction between uh, azelic acid uh, and, uh, and zinc deficiency because this is one of the, the AZI1 gene is one of the key genes that is required for the response of, uh, of the plants to this, to this signal immunity related signaling compound. And indeed it is. So if, if we look under zinc deficiency, uh, we can see that uh, basically um, the, the reduction of root growth rate that we observe in wild type uh, with the application of AZA is abolished um, in zinc limited conditions. And this abolishment is largely dependent on AZI1. So we, so we think there is a complicated, so, so that AZI1, uh, so azelic acid uh, immune related signals are dependent on the zinc status of the plants. Um, and we, we even like thought this is, this is very interesting. We don't really know what this means. I mean, we know that zinc and iron as well are very, very important for immune responses. Uh, and that there's, uh, in, in many systems, there is a kind of war for, for iron and also zinc is used for defense responses. Um, whether this uh, simple interaction is, is also conserved in different plant species. And so, um, so uh, we did the experiment in rice because it was in hand uh, for a collaborator of Hartem. And so you can see that actually this um, root inhibition of root development, so when we increase the concentration of AZA under normal conditions, zinc sufficient, we basically um, inhibit the formation of the root completely, right, uh, or the emergence of the root. And uh, if we remove the zinc from the medium, we basically don't affect this process at all, right? So, so, there, uh, so this interaction of, of zinc levels and, AZ, uh, and azelic acid and um, in Abidopsis, uh, depend on AZI1, is, um, is truly somehow a process that's relevant for, for many species. And, and the big question is, why, why is it actually? OK, but that's a question that I can't answer right now. Um, I mean, just other than speculating. OK, so I just go to the acknowledgments. So I hope I've shown you that um, you know, the, the ways how we approach this problem using natural variation can tell us a lot on how roots decide to grow or not to grow, because it depends on genes and genetic variants, how at which levels and which time actually growth is stopped. And presumably defenses in, in, in those two cases are, are basically defense responses are started. And, and, and this work was mainly done by, um, the, so the iron-related work was done by Sandro Satpai, a postdoc who started a couple of years ago at the GMI, now came with me to SOC, which I'm very happy about, uh, was assisted by a master's student, very talented. And the second part of the story was also done by Sandro Satpai, and, and, uh, and, and most of the work was actually done in Hartem's uh, Rochette's lab at, in Montpellier by Nadia Bouhain. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, these are all still Do you know what the mechanism of stopping growth is at the growth level? Yeah, that's that's a that's a very that's a very good question. Um, well, we know that the meristem basically they it gets shorter. Cell division activity goes down, so there will be uh, there will be signaling on the cell cycle. Uh, by which means we don't really know whether it's like you know auxin dependent or uh, or any other signaling pathway we don't really know um, but yeah once we have all this we can actually test this using mutants yeah. um, I thought it was very interesting that uh, in the absence of sulfur and phosphorus the root growth speeded up or went past that uh, but you chose to look at the inhibition rather than the promotion. What was the reason for that? And can you say anything about these enhanced elongation rates? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So we also pursued um, the um, growth control and, and phosphate. Um, but uh, with the iron, um, um, we were just faster. So with the phosphate, we haven't quite figured out. We didn't find, for instance, so, so we. OK, so we didn't increase the number of accessions to have better mapping ability in phosphate because we were um, the postdoc who was working on the iron was faster doing this. So it's not, it's not intentional design. 
but rather the way how it is historically developed. With, with Foster, so, so one thing that I'm currently doing at SOC is uh, that, we, um, will, that we are overcoming some bottlenecks for those studies. So the major bottleneck is actually pipetting hands right now to put the seats on plates. And so I'm building right now a robot, and we will do basically all these conditions uh, with a 1,000 accessions, and we'll have much better mapping ability, and then can really, in, in, in phosphate conditions, also consider this multi-gene approach. So, so yeah, so I, probably in, in five years I can answer your question. So it's sort of a live question um, of being a physiologist and being more familiar with growing plants and their hydroponics. Uh, growing plants in the agar is, especially around dots, is terribly convenient, but it's not really a resource limiting condition. So one of my first questions would be, have you tested these plants and relationships under other growth conditions such that you verify it, number one, and number two is, have you grown these plants out for longer periods of time where the root systems will become more elaborate and you see if those relationships yeah, yeah. So, so that is a very valid concerns, concern. Uh, so, so first of all, we are most interested in the signaling aspect in this kind of decision making aspect. Um, so, uh, so, so we think actually growing them very early already tells us something about this. Now, if we are thinking about everything that relates to adaptation, I think it's very, very important to consider soil. Uh, and, and, and later growth phenotypes. And in other projects that I didn't talk about where we looked at more at the, at the angle at which roots grow and we found a, a, a very interesting gene, an exorcist gene, that, uh, uh, that actually affects how our oxygen is transported. We did the experiment that we uh, basically cut the extreme accessions that we knew were very d different in their early growth behavior in very large soil pots. And then we did excavation um, and indeed, those accessions were very different in terms of their rooting depth. So, in that, in 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 in, uh, for, for in, in that, for that question, it it seems that there was a very almost linear relationship between those early growth rates that we measured and the the rooting depth. Now, that is not not necessarily true for other conditions. For instance, if you, if we think about those nutrient deficiencies, of course, at some point. You know, plants will run out of the nutrients, and then they, I mean, they don't have enough to grow, right? So, so, so that would be anyway, like the, the question of nutrient efficiency and homeostasis is a very different question from the, the one that we're asking right now. But it, it would be good, yeah. I mean, like for questions that, uh, that, um, that, that are related to adaptation, we have to do those experiments. And I agree. And we're doing uh, as much as we can. <laughs> So I had a couple of questions. Uh, in one of the slides, you showed that uh, along with the changes in root growth, there was also a change in the hypogotyl. Um, yes. So related to the previous question, is there, um, as the plants grow, do you think one strategy for root development is better or um, better over other, or it would depend on the integrative aspects of plant physiology? I think in the end it's the integrated aspect of plant physiology because the plant has to grow and, and produce enough seeds to survive and that is the trait I mean uh, that will be selected on uh, for sure but but the environment I mean all these accessions will have adapted to certain environments and the way how you actually are more fit in those different environments will be very different um, um, just the question that I referred with the root system architecture where we then really looked at um, root system in the soil uh, um, that really related to precipitation seasonality. So, so the alleles that conferred either the shallow or the deep one were, uh, were basically correlated with the frequency of rainfall in the areas where they came from. So it, it really depends, I mean, the, a good root system is only good for a certain number of environments and, and not for all environments, at, at least for those wild uh, species, I think. Second question was, uh, you said that there was the module was discovered through Aranet. So how far back does the uh, uh, inter interaction go between the other kinases? How far? Uh, In evolutionary time, when did this interact? Yeah, I would, I, would, I would need to look that up. But, uh, but they basically, what they did for generating the phylogenomic score, they looked at orthologs in many different genomes and looked at either co-occurrence or co-absent, like you know, either one or the other. But I, I would need to look that up. 
that these um, roots generate um, develop root ears at this point? Yes, but that also depends on the on the on the condition. We, we really haven't looked for this, but we know uh, it was very obvious in the mutants that in uh, two of the mutants of the receptor kinases, the, the root hairs were stunted, which is also associated with iron deficiency responses. So, uh, but we haven't looked in a systematic manner. Because on those plate assays that we do, it, it's, it's impossible to, dis, uh, to, to, uh, to get the resolution for the root hairs. In an anecdotal way, were the root hairs and the roots themselves you could say so, yes. I mean, like, uh, like when there was like bigger growth inhibition observed in the in the mutant, the root hairs seemed to be more screwed up. But I, I mean, I don't. I mean, I would really need to look at. It's it's very anecdotal, and that might be very biased <laughs> because the way how those things are noticed are very biased, typically. Yeah. Two more last two last questions. Have you <laughs> What do you think? Uh, the factor that causing the, the different expression level of FAO, FRO2 uh, messenger RNA so among the different sections? So my hypothesis is we haven't tested it, but I think it is there are a couple of polymorphisms in the coding region that don't lead to changes in the amino acid sequence. I think actually this will relate to RNA stability. Um, there's also this study where they overexpressed FRO2 with a 35S promoter under control in iron conditions. And even though the 35S shouldn't be affected by the iron uh, deficiency, the expression level of FRO2 was still higher under iron deficiency, which would suggest a post-transcriptional uh, regulation. And, and that would be in line with the polymorphisms that we observe in the, in the transcript. But we haven't tested it. But, but then it will be an RNA turnover factor somehow. I have, uh, first of all, it's a great work, as uh, I'm sure you know. So really, Thank you. very nice. And uh, then I have one technical question. Light intensity in our redoxy, uh, as I know, if you grow it under less than 400 microamps, or they are under deficient light. And most people don't do that. So this is the question. What is the light intensity you work on? And the second question is, in agriculture, most crops will allocate carbon to the above ground and have and shorter roots would be a big advantage for, for, for crops. So the function, like you showed, so is very important, like silane or do you think about the function of the roots? Or not, but your main thing is the length, so that's easy to do. But the function of the roots could be a very short but very efficient root. A absolutely, I mean, I, I fully agree. I, I think the root system architecture then at a later stage would tell us a lot about, you know, which soil layers can be explored, how efficient that they, they are for this. I mean, we, we haven't really done this systematically. We would like to, and I think there are w uh, ways to, to look at later root systems. Um, yeah, so we would love to think about this. But, and, and we do as far as we can, but we really haven't systematically studied later root architecture. And then the, the light intensity, um, I would need to look up how many micro Einsteins are used. What we know is that we test described mutants for iron, uh, like the FRO2 mutant, also the IRT1, uh, uh, that they basically, uh, whether we can reproduce the effects that were, uh, uh, that were described for them. And under our light conditions, we actually recapitulate the effects that were described. So, yeah. Well, let's thank Wolfgang von This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.